Good evening, everyone. My name is Kaylee Perret Shaughnessy, and I'm the director of the Whittier Birthplace. I'm pleased to welcome Leslie Greenleaf Santa Maria as our speaker in tonight's virtual lecture series. Tonight's program is supported by a grant from the Bridge Street Fund, a special initiative of Mass Humanities. So thank you, Mass Humanities, for tonight's um, wonderful presentation. Um, Leslie is a children's book author, and she is in the process of writing a new book about John Greenleaf Whittier. So thank you, Leslie. Take it away. Yes, well, thank you, Kaylee, for that introduction, and thank you for asking me to speak this evening. It's always a pleasure to talk about two of my favorite things, John Greenleaf Whittier and children's literature. My presentation tonight is based on my graduation lecture that I gave earlier this year for my MFA in creative writing from Spalding University, which is out in Kentucky. Um, I've also drawn on some workshops that I've taught at writers conferences, but I tailored tonight's talk to focus a bit on my work in progress. So with that, I will go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. Okay, you should be seeing my title slide there. Great. Let me just move uh, my little thing over here. Great. So my work in progress is a children's picture book biography entitled Fighting Slavery with His Pen, the story of poet and abolitionist John Greenleaf Whittier. I will also cover tonight the how-tos of writing a picture book biography that gets young readers interested in important historical figures. So my goals in general are to give you some insight into the creation of picture book biographies, and then in particular, to get you excited about telling today's young people about Whittier. But first, uh, a little about my relationship to Whittier. So my maiden name is Greenleaf, and I was told growing up that I was a descendant of Whittier, and I'm still working to determine my exact relationship and the terminology there. But as for Whittier, of course, his paternal grandmother was Sarah Greenleaf. She was the wife of Joseph Whittier, and they married in 1739. Their son, John Whittier, married Abigail Husey in 1804. Then Abigail and John were the parents of John Greenleaf Whittier. So for his middle name, they chose the maiden name of his paternal grandmother. I found this information in this genealogy of the Greenleaf family. It was compiled in 1896 by James Edward Greenleaf. And on page 156, it says, John Whittier married Abigail, daughter of Samuel and Mercy, and they had four children, and the second of whom was John Greenleaf Whittier. So I don't know how old I was when I was first told that Whittier was my ancestor, but I started writing when I was 11. And by the time I was in high school in Baltimore, I was already interested in being a writer, so I did what was called an advanced independent study with the head of the English department, Mr. Thomas Schaefer. So he suggested that I spend the semester analyzing Whittier's poetry and writing some of my own. Now, one of my writings uh, that year was a parody of Whittier's poem, The Barefoot Boy. And I called it, as you might guess, <laughs> The Barefoot Girl. So in this poem, I was trying to show the things that little girls of Whittier's era might have been forbidden to do and to offer a different way for mothers to raise their girls in the future. Of course, the parody doesn't hold a candle to the original, as you can imagine, uh, but it was a good learning experience for me. Then in graduate school recently, one of my mentors, that's children's author Edie Hemingway, uh, no relationship to Ernest Hemingway, she introduced me to The Noisy Paint Box by Barb Rosenstock and illustrated by Mary Grandpre. 
The subtitle says, The Colors and Sounds of Sand Kandinsky's Abstract Art. So it tells the story of Kandinsky as a young boy hearing colors. Today, many believe that he had synesthesia, which is a genetic order, disorder where one sense triggers a different sense. For example, hearing colors, seeing music, and smelling numbers. So that is fascinating to me. And I fell in love with this book in, gem in particular. And in general, I fell in love with picture book biographies. Picture book biographies are often used in the classroom and they sell well in the school and library markets. You might also see some for sale in museum gift shops. They've been in high demand for many years now, but editors are now getting more selective uh, on the ones that they acquire. And I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. So I began to consider writing a biographical picture book about Whittier. I studied and analyzed the genre and I wrote several short essays. And then, as I said, I gave my graduation lecture on the topic and then I gave it a try. So this is the working title. And I say working title because I'll be seeking traditional publication. And in that arena, writers should hold titles loosely. Uh, publishers often come up with titles that are better suited to position the book to sell well. Uh, they know the titles that will grab the attention of the buyers that they're targeting. So I worked with Edie Hemingway on the story, as well as Beth Ann Bauman and Leslie Newman. They also are published children's authors and instructors at Spalding. And Leslie Newman, as a side note, was the poet laureate of Northampton a few years back. Next, I sent the manuscript to a sensitivity reader, Edwina Perkins, is the managing editor of Harambee Press. She also runs a service called Sensitivity Between the Lines. And that service will match sensitivity readers to authors who have written about another culture. The role of the sensitivity reader is not to censor the work, but to assist the writer in creating accurate portrayals of the people in the manuscript. So since Whittier's story includes his work to help bring an end to slavery, I wanted to make sure I represented Black Americans authentically. So Edwina did things like she flagged the phrase pro-freedom president that I had initially used to um, describe Lincoln. And she suggested replacing the word slavery with synonyms uh, more often than I already had. So these might seem like small details, but they're not trivial. I mean, they're important details. So I'm glad I hired Edwina to be a sensitivity reader. Then I sent the manuscript to Kaylee Perret Shoffnessy, who is, of course, the executive director of Whittier Birthplace. Kaylee uh, graciously read the latest draft and she made some comments and answered a few questions for me. Uh, next, I let the manuscript rest a little while because that's always a wise step in the process. Um, it allows your subconscious to consider the writing and it enables you to return to the project with fresh perspective. Uh, next, I will give it one more pass before sending it to my agent uh, because in writing, multiple rounds of revision are truly essential. Ernest Hemingway says, the only kind of writing is rewriting. And literary agent Donald Moss says, writing is revising. So you can see it takes a village to write a picture book biography. Um, and my, my project isn't even with an editor yet. So there will be more hands in, in the pie as you, as you know, if you will. I wish I could read the entire text to you, but because the session is recorded, 
I would risk that potential publishers might be concerned that the text is already out there in the public domain. But I, I will read a short excerpt to you in just a moment. So the goals of my story are to introduce children to Whittier, to inspire children to speak up for justice, and to help children understand that we can all do our part. Uh, because even though Whittier was not able to fight physically in the Civil War, he dedicated much of his life and writings to the abolitionist movement. He was put in danger for that several times, and it cost him many professional opportunities. And yet he counted the cost and repeatedly made the decision to continue speaking out against slavery. So now I will read uh, the story's opening to you. Hang Whittier, hang Whittier. John Greenleaf Whittier, editor of the Pennsylvania Freeman, known for its articles against slavery, stopped in his tracks. An angry mob stood outside Pennsylvania Hall, protesting the abolition meetings being held inside. A dozen men beat a battering ram against the door. Bam, bam, bam. The door burst open and the men rushed inside. John hustled to a friend's house and threw on a wig and long overcoat. Pretending to be part of the crowd, John entered the building shouting, hang Whittier. As the horde ransacked his office, he tucked his newspaper plates from the next day's edition inside the coat. Moments later, John escaped and the mob set fire to the building. Whoosh! Pennsylvania Hall burned to the ground. Why would he risk his life to fight for this cause? So that's just the opening scene. And from there, the manuscript goes sort of back to his childhood. And I'll explain that for you in a second. Uh, now I'm going to move on and talk more generally about how to write uh, biographical picture books. I'll start with some numbers for context. Picture books are what I believe most people first think of when they hear the phrase children's book. These are highly illustrated works of art that beautifully blend text and artwork. They're released mainly in hardcover, but sometimes in softcover too. Some examples in fiction would be Good Night Moon by Margaret Wise Brown or Where the Wild Things Are by Maurice Sendak. Some nonfiction examples would be All About Birds by Polly Cheeseman and Spiders by Gail Gibbons. These titles are what is referred to as all about books or survey books that introduce children broadly to a topic. Picture books are for children ages four to eight and they are typically 32 pages long. Today's editors want the word counts to be 700 words or below, which is not a lot of words. Some are asking that the manuscripts actually be 500 words or less, or even 300 words or less. Picture book biographies are one type of nonfiction picture book. The target readership here is slightly older and broken into two age groups, six to eight years old and eight to 12. They are typically 32 to 48 pages long, and the word counts here could go as high as 1,500 words or more, uh, but that the word count will be different from publisher to publisher. So in a nutshell, picture book biographies introduce children to ordinary people who did great things despite difficulties. And in the process, they can teach kids about a lot of things like history, cultures, even math and science concepts. Now here's an interesting photo for you. Uh, Donna Janelle Bowman is the author of several picture book biographies and she writes this. When done well, they look effortless. In reality, crafting an irresistible 32 to 48 page picture book biography 
is like carving a giant redwood tree down to an eight by 10 picture frame. So while the idea of chiseling a focused short narrative out of a person's entire life might seem daunting, understanding four of the main characteristics of a picture book biography can be helpful. A picture book biography presents an inspiring subject, grabs and keeps young readers' attention, is based on solid research, and provides additional info. The first characteristic is uh, inspiring subject. So a good subject is one whose story can inspire children to work toward goals and accomplishments that are similar to those of the story's hero. For example, a biography about Thomas Edison should get children interested in inventions. So picture book biographies, they show that there are myriad ways to overcome obstacles, to succeed and to contribute to society. Good subjects can be uh, people who have been successful in any noteworthy field, such as government, education, science, art, and so on. Now, some biographies shed new light on well-known figures, like world leaders or celebrities, and other biographies introduce readers to lesser-known heroes. An example of a picture book biography of a well-known subject is Before She Was Harriet. This is by Lisa Klein Ransom and illustrated by James E. Ransom. Young readers might know that Harriet Tubman led slaves to freedom on the Underground Railroad, and yet they might be less familiar with the other aspects of her life. So this book focuses on the many names that Harriet went by at different stages in her life, including Araminta, Minty, and Moses. So these names reveal the diverse roles that she fulfilled in her lifetime. And the poetry in this book is exquisite. Here's an excerpt. I'll read that to you. Before she was a suffragist, she was General Tubman, rising out of the fog, armed with courage, strong in the face of rebels and planters and overseers. As they watched, fields burned and bridges fall and 700 slaves stopped chopping and start running to a woman who ferried them to freedom on the Cumbie River turned River Jordan. Isn't that lovely? Uh, it's, it's such a well-written book. I highly recommend it. Now here's a biography about a lesser known subject. Ada Byron Lovelace and the Thinking Machine is written by Laurie Walmark and illustrated by April Chu. Ada Byron Lovelace wrote the world's first computer program, but not many elementary school children know this. So the opening spread of this book begins with, Ada was born into a world of poetry, but numbers, not words, captured her imagination. And then it mentions that her father was the famous romantic poet, Lord Byron, and the artwork on that opening spread shows a scene in her childhood home with great detail given to the clothing the people are wearing and the decor of the room to show readers that Ada lived in the 1800s. So similarly, uh, Whittier is not well known among school-aged children these days. So my biography has to give readers some context to understand when he lived and what was going on in the world at that time. So after that first scene that I read to you, I mention uh, the year and the place of his birth. And then I refer to the Civil War, of course, for that needed context. So if you endeavor to write a picture book biography, the notoriety of your subject will determine your approach. And once you have a subject in mind, you must grab the reader's attention by choosing a good narrative slant or focus, 
by starting the book with a hook and using fiction techniques throughout the text. So in the next few slides, we will look mainly at narrative slant, but I will also cover hook and fiction techniques along the way. Focus is important because you have a big story to tell in a small space. And that story must capture the essence of the person and inspire young readers to action. So in a text of so few words, you can't include everything from the subject's life, you know, from birth to death. That's called the cradle to grave approach. And that approach will result in just a brief overview of the key events of the subject's life. And it will end up sounding like an encyclopedia entry, and it won't grab kids' attention. Currently, publishers and teachers are looking for narratives that focus on a specific element of the subject's life, like you know, a singular achievement or an event from the person's life. And these stories are sometimes referred to as slice of life stories rather than whole life stories. So what makes a good slant? Well, basically you're looking for elements from the subject's life that children will find compelling. And I think they come in three varieties. First, we have the wow factor. These are things that children will find exciting, cool, or thrilling. So you would think about what is something uh, my subject did or experienced that's especially memorable. This might end up being the opening hook of the book, a hook being something that's irresistible, that grabs the reader's attention and pulls them into the story. We have to keep in mind that kids today have a plethora of entertainment options available, as you know. And kids today are what I call astute consumers of story. Uh, they've been exposed to story since birth in terms of cartoons, movies, television, and even gaming. Their video games have storylines. Even television commercials now have actual storylines sometimes that are executed in 60 seconds or less. You know, if, if I blink, I can miss the whole point of the commercial. So it takes a lot to grab the attention of young readers and keep it. In Whittier's life, I think the fact that he couldn't fight in the war, but he risked his life to fight slavery in other ways, might catch a kid's attention. I think the fact that his enemies burned down his office and that he was pursued by a mob you know, that has the wow factor. Second would be events or situations from the subject's life that children might be able to relate to. Uh, this is why so many picture book biographies actually begin with a scene from the subject's childhood that shaped what the subject did as an adult. Now in Whittier's life, I don't think children will be able to relate to the burning of his office but they might be able to relate to young Whittier observing his mother uh, offering hospitality. You know, she invited many passing strangers into her home and fed them and cared for them. And that really modeled for Whittier what he then did as an adult in terms of working for the fair treatment and welfare of others. So that is something that today's kids might be able to relate to. The third is um, the emotions that are universal to childhood. Examples would be, you know, all children want to have fun. They want to be noticed and valued. They have fears and longings. If we can tap into these universal emotions of childhood, then children will keep reading or listening if they're being read to. And it will open their hearts to consider the messages of the story. An example from my story is Whittier's longing as a child to do more than farm work. Um, supposedly, his first poem was this. And must I always swing the flail and carry back the watering pail? 
I want to go away to school. I do not want to be a fool. So I think the universal longing for more represented in that little poem might be a good touchstone for kids. Also, I think his outrage against injustice is something children will appreciate because um, children this age are actually very passionate about justice and fairness. After all, one of their favorite lines is, you know, that's not fair. They, they really do care about fairness. So uh, tap into universal childhood emotions. A major factor in choosing a narrative slant will be your intended audience. You have to choose to target either the six to eight year olds or the eight to 12 year olds. Stories for younger readers should be simple narratives, while the stories for older readers can be more complex. For example, we have Patrick McDonald's Me Jane, and this is for the younger set. It's only 218 words, and it tells a simple story of young Jane Goodall. She's carrying a stuffed monkey, as you can see on the cover of the book there. And she's studying the animals around her home, imagining herself doing that in Africa someday. A River of Words is for the eight to 12 year old group. It's a biography of poet William Carlos Williams, written by Jen Bryant and illustrated by Melissa Sweet. The length is 833 words, but both the text and the illustrations um, are layered with meanings that older children can pick up on. And you can even see it in the artwork on the cover there. It's, it's very layered and a lot of things to look at and think about. Another factor in choosing your angle is the intended takeaway for your reader. A takeaway is the message or theme that you'd like your reader to walk away with. So decide on your theme early, if possible, and post it somewhere prominent and try to keep the writing focused on that goal. Bowman asks this question, what is the universal belief about life that your character's journey reveals? That belief might be, you know, in the power of kindness or the fact that words matter, or as in my story, that every person can make a difference and so on. Keeping your theme in clear view will help you choose which events from the subject's life to include in the story, since you can't include all the events of their life. So if you embark on writing a biography uh, or any writing for that matter, don't worry too much if you can't nail down your focus or your theme exactly in the beginning. These will often become more clear as you continue to research and write early drafts, but you might start with at least an idea of what your theme might be. The noisy paint box is a good example of narrative focus. It zooms in immediately on the gift of a paint box that Kandinsky received as a child that sparked his work as an adult. Again, you see a lot of these biographies begin with something from the subject's childhood because children aren't as interested in hearing about adults. They think adults are boring. So they want to hear about other children. So if you hook them with something from the subject's younger years, then the narrative can pull the reader along into the subject's adult life. So after Kandinsky receives the paint box in this book, the rest of it shows what happened to him when he painted. And everything about this text really serves the book's theme, which is, I believe, uh, the importance of developing your unique talents, even if they're different from what others expect. Here is another good example of narrative focus. Gietel's Journey, an Ellis Island story, is written by Leslea Newman, illustrated by Amy June Bates, and it is based on Newman's family history. 
here, the focus is achieved by the timeline of the story and by a sort of book ending device. The timeline is short. The story begins the day before Gita leaves her home country and focuses entirely on her migration to Ellis Island. And then at the end, there, there's a few months that are captured in the resolution. As for the book ending device, the story begins with Gitel packing a set of candlesticks to take on the journey, and the book ends with Gitel and her mother lighting the Shabbos candles in the candlesticks that Gitel brought to the new world. So in that way, the candlesticks neatly bookend this focus narrative. Now, it's important here to make a distinction between narrative nonfiction and historical fiction. Narrative nonfiction employs fiction techniques to tell a true story. Historical fiction tells a story based on past events, but with some fictionalized elements added. And so Gietel's journey is actually classified as historical fiction. In the author's note in the back of the book, Newman explains. She says, uh, Gietel's journey is based on a true story. Actually, Gietel's journey is based on two true stories from my childhood. So Newman uh, blended the actual immigration experiences from her grandmother and great-grandmother with that of her godmother's mother to create the journey of one combined character, Gito. Now, my story is narrative nonfiction. I did not make up any scenes or facts or characters or even dialogue. I tried to stay true to Whittier's own words, and I didn't include anything that I couldn't confirm in at least one primary source, you know, preferably two or more. And I'll talk about sources in just a moment. I did apply some techniques of fiction in writing the story. So that takes us to the third way to grab and keep the attention of young readers, which is using fiction techniques to tell the story. The first one on that list is giving the text a classic story arc, which means in its most basic terms, a story arc is a beginning, a middle, and an end. But in more expanded terms, we might say an exciting beginning, an active middle with rising tension, a climax or ultimate challenge of some sort, and a resolution or a short wrap up at the end. So my story begins, um, as you heard, with the burning of the hall. And then the narrative goes back to describe some aspects of his childhood. Then the story shows him setting out to fight slavery with increased opposition and danger. And then the climax is Whittier hearing the bells toll at the ratification of the 13th Amendment. In the resolution, I include a scene of the Fisk singers from Fisk University in Nashville coming to his home to honor him with a performance. So in that way, the story has a, a classic narrative arc, which readers will, re will expect. Next, we have a character arc. That is simply showing that the subject grows internally in some way, from some sort of weakness or misbelief in the beginning, to a change or enlightenment in the end. In my story, Whittier's uh, weakness, if you will, is that he began as a poor, uh, little educated boy, developed health problems, but nevertheless, he learned how to give his all for what he believed was a calling on his life. Next, we have writing in scenes that are illustratable. Um, in a picture book, the text must leave room for the artwork to show part of the story. And so the text should focus on scenes and action for the illustrator to draw. You'll want to refrain from telling 
which is exposition, and concentrate on showing, that is action. And finally, we have poetic devices. These are literary techniques like rhyme, rhythm, alliteration, metaphor, and so on. There's a list online at literarydevices.net of, of over 100 literary devices. Essentially, any literary device available to a poet might also be used to keep the text of a picture book lively and layered and entertaining. So here's an example of using poetic devices. It's from William Still and his Freedom Stories, written and illustrated by Don Tate. Now, this is a powerful picture book biography. It tells the story of William Still, who is called the father of the Underground Railroad. His parents escaped slavery, but had to leave two sons behind. These were Still's younger brothers. Um, as an adult, Still worked with the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society, and he wrote down the stories of escaped slaves as he met them, which ended up helping many families to be reunited. And there's a, a remarkable twist in Still's story that I won't spoil for you. But this excerpt uh, describes his life as a young man, and I'll read it to you. He threshed clamshells, hauled wood, laid bricks. He peddled oysters, dug wells, hawked clothes. He worked on a dock, then a hotel, barely earning the smell of money. And I just love that image at the end, that metaphor. And here's another excerpt. This is a little uh, from a little later in his life when he was in Philadelphia. The passengers who arrived in Philadelphia were tired. They were sick and hungry, cut up, broken, marred and maimed, frantic, fearful, and fed up, but hopeful. And so this excerpt, as well as the entire book, um, there's a lot of attention given to sound devices like alliteration and consonants and assonance. Um, and the lines are succinct and poetic. So now we'll move on to the third characteristic of a picture book biography is based on solid research. You research a picture book biography much the same as you would a biography for any reader. You need to study a quantity of quality sources. And since this lecture is for a museum, I'm probably preaching to the choir here in terms of needing quality research, but I'd be remiss if I didn't make that point here. Um, children's author Jan Fields says this, good nonfiction for kids is so intensely researched that the writer becomes a kind of expert on the subject so that that expertise can be translated into clear, readable prose. It's very difficult to write clearly about something you don't totally understand, and an editor can always spot places where a writer is fudging over something else she isn't really sure about. And I would add that kids, too, can recognize a text that isn't created from an abundance of research because that text will lack focus, it will lack energy, and children will lose interest. In your research, it's important to use as many primary sources as possible, to limit secondary sources, and to avoid dubious sources altogether. Uh, primary sources are immediate firsthand accounts of a topic from people with a direct connection to the topic. So this would be your subject's personal diaries, letters, uh, photographs of the person, and so on. Secondary sources are anything written by someone without a direct connection with the topic. So these are one set one step removed, and they add a layer of interpretation. So this would be uh, books, articles, documentaries about the subject, encyclopedia entries, and so on. 
This book by Donna Janelle Bowman is based on solid research. It's called Step Right Up, How Doc, Key, How Doc and Jim Key Taught the World About Kindness. And it's illustrated by Daniel Minter. I always like to mention the illustrator if I if at all possible, because the illustrations really do tell part of the story. Now, the back matter in this book has a bibliography and it lists uh, 43 sources for a children's book. And I suspect that that represents only the materials that she relied upon the most. Uh, Bowman probably consulted even more sources than that. Many primary source documents are digitized and can be viewed online. Here are some places you can find primary sources. However, many primary documents are not available online. And so we must view those in person at museums, historical societies, and library archives. In my research, I carefully documented my sources, of course, in a master bibliography, but I also used endnotes in my working draft that gives uh, the evidence of the claims the story makes. So this means that nearly every sentence has an endnote telling where I got the information to write that sentence. This is my annotated copy, and I won't submit that to my agent or to an editor unless they request it. I'll send a clean copy of the manuscript initially. So nonfiction biographies must be historically accurate. However, there can be gaps in the historical records, and how authors handle that varies. Um, biblical purists wouldn't allow for making up any content, but some authors do add dialogue or some sensory details to a scene. Uh, if so, those fictional elements added must be closely based on information found in the primary sources. And I think that those elements should be pointed out in an author's note at the end of the book. And I'll, I'll describe an author's note more in just a moment. I began my research reading the story of John Greenleaf Whittier by Francis E. Cook, uh, which is on the left there. It was first published in 1900, just eight years after Whittier's death, and was republished in 2018 by The Good and the Beautiful, which is a homeschool curriculum publisher. In the introductory note, uh, Cook mentions being especially indebted to the life and letters of John Greenleaf Whittier. That was published in 1895 and compiled by Samuel T. Picard, who, as many of you might know, married Whittier's niece and became Whittier's literary executor. Now, Cook's book is for young readers, and I read it first just to get a quick view of what one author thought young readers might be interested in. The book on the right is The Poetry of John Greenleaf Whittier, edited and introduced by William Jolliffe. This book has a good short introduction to Whittier's life. Um, it also has a foreword written by John B. Picard, who is, was the grandson of Samuel T. Picard. John B., who went by Ben, was also a Whittier scholar, and he taught at the University of Florida for most of his life. In 1975, John B., that's Ben Picard, edited The Letters of John Greenleaf Whittier. It's a three-volume set because Whittier wrote a lot of letters that survived, um, and this was published by an imprint of Harvard University Press. All three of these volumes have been digitized by both the Hathi Trust and archive.org. And I found the search engines of those two sites to be you know, user-friendly and they were robust. I didn't have any problem with it, but I found myself going back to those titles so often um, that I decided to buy a set for, for my own library. 
Now, Ben Picard passed away in 2015, and so I'm eager to know who are considered today's Whittier scholars, and maybe some of you can help me with that. So far, my bibliography has nearly 40 sources, and that's for a 1,500-word manuscript with five pages of back matter. Which brings us to the rest of the story. Picture book biographies provide additional information. The term for this is back matter. This refers to anything that appears in the book after the main story, in the back of the book, basically. Types of back, back matter include glossaries, timelines, maps, photographs, and so on. My manuscript includes a timeline that has events from Whittier's life along with relevant historical events that happened during his lifetime and influenced his work. I also have a list of resources and an author's note of about 700 more words. The author's note is particularly important. This is where the author explains why he or she wrote this particular book. It's also where the author shares any interesting details that uh, came up in the research, but didn't make it into the main narrative. It's also where the author issues a call to action or a challenge of some sort to the reader. For example, in the biography of William Stills, that ends with sort of an implied call to action. It says this, William Stills records and the stories he preserved reunited families torn apart by slavery, because that's what stories can do. Protest injustice, soothe, teach, inspire, connect. Stories save lives. William's stories needed to be told, so slavery's nightmare will never happen again. And that's a sort of call to action for all of us here tonight. I think we need to keep telling Whittier's story and the stories of the rest of the abolitionists. So here are the works that I mentioned in this talk. There are two pages worth, and you can go back and look at those on the recording more closely if you'd like. And here are three more resource resources, um, which will help you if you would like to write a picture book biography. So in conclusion, I hope this has piqued your interest in reading biographies of noteworthy historical figures to children or promoting them or even writing one yourself. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have now, um, or you can feel free to reach out to me via email. And I see we do have a couple questions in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen that we can see each other. There you are. Thank you, Leslie. That was uh, very informative and I loved all the different references to other children's books as well. So some good things to add to kind of our own bookshelves that are already out and published. Um, the conversation in the chat, um, unfortunately, one of, one of the attendees had to leave early. Um, so it was more of a goodbye message than a, okay. than a question. Um, all right. But if anybody else has anything that they'd like to add, um, feel free to either type it in the chat and I can read it out, or you can take yourself off mute and turn your camera on if you want and ask away. Uh, Leslie, um, yes. in your childhood, were there any particular biographies or books that really got you interested in, in reading that you might remember? Oh, that's a good question. I don't remember any particular uh, biographies from my childhood. You know, I really discovered this as a genre, uh, raising my own children and then becoming a writer for children. And um, they have taken off in the last 10, 12 years. The market has really exploded. Um, but yeah, I think as a child, you know, I was interested in the fact that I was related to Whittier. So I, I read his poetry, but there I didn't have a biography that I could read 
of him when I was a child, um, I probably would have been drawn to biographies about writers, um, that sort of thing. When I was in grades one through four in Haverhill, Mass, we had what was called the bookmobile, which was a library on four wheels that would come to this grammar school that I attended that was built in 1898 because I remember looking at the numbers when you're in the playground in granite on the outside of the building. And there was a whole series of biographies of famous Americans. For example, Booker T. Washington, Clara Barton, Bernie Pyle, who turned out to be a writer in World War II. Um, there was just a whole series. They were bound with an orange cover. The original covers had probably been worn away. And I just went from one to another, to another, to another, to another. And I think for me, that's how I get interested in reading biographies and reading nonfiction um, at an early age. And that's why I was wondering if you had ever had a similar inspiration. Yeah, that is really interesting. And it really has shaped your, your work as an adult, that interest in biographies. Did you read a lot broadly? Did you read fiction as well or just nonfiction? Well, as a little, you know, I'm thinking back as a little kid, if you were a boy, it was the Heidi Boys. If you were a girl, it was Nancy Drew Mysteries. And my sister's reading Nancy Drew. And after I got finished reading the Hardy Boys, I started reading the Nancy Drew Mysteries. Um, it's whatever happened to be there in the late 50s, early 60s. Sure. For kids. So I little, read a little bit of both. But as, as times went by, I found nonfiction far more interesting than, than fiction and still do to this day. Yeah, that's interesting. I read more fiction as a child. That's just what was available to me um, and got more interested in nonfiction as an adult. Uh, any other questions or comments? Have, have you found in your experience um, whether it's in Florida or anywhere else where you're talking with other authors. I can't hear your audio right now. Jay, you seem to have cut out. My connection is unstable. Ah, you are back. Oh, okay. Um, I, I wanted to know, in, in interacting with other authors and, and writers, the name Whittier, does it ring Does it ring a bell of familiarity in this 21st century, or do you get more of, well, who was he? Um, I, I've come across a number of people who are familiar with Whittier. Um, my undergraduate was at the College of Notre Dame in Maryland. And I had a lot of uh, nuns who were my professors, and they were very familiar with his work. Um, and in graduate school, we had um, a whole section that was dedicated towards poetry. I was in the children's writing section. There were a lot of poets in my graduate school, and a number of them had read Whittier. Um, interestingly, Kaylee and I were talking about this earlier, you know, there's a, a real interest these days in social justice. And um, that's a very big part of what Whittier wrote. So there's like a renewed interest among poets, I think. Yes, we were discussing earlier, I think in the early 20th century, Whittier was known for his poems like Snowbound and The Barefoot Boy, where he creates kind of a sunny, existence on the farm or snowy existence on the farm. Um, but now a lot of his earlier poems dealing with abolition and social justice are coming back to the foreground and people are rediscovering Woodier as kind of the rabble rouser and not the, the happy farmer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. I'm glad to see that. 
Well, if there are no other questions. No. OK. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And um, if oh, so we are taking a break in December. There will be no uh, virtual lecture series next month. So have a happy holidays, everyone. We will return in January on the fourth Thursday of January for Quaking Dover, a history of the Quaker community in Dover, New Hampshire. Um, so please join us again in January. And if you feel like you're missing out and you can't, can't wait to get another lecture, um, we do have all of our past virtual lectures available on our YouTube page. Thank you, everybody. And have a good night. Well, thank, thank you for having me. Thank you, Lisa. It was a fascinating talk, and I'm looking forward to seeing the, the finished product. Oh, yes. Thank you. I will let you know right away when it's in, in print. <laughs>